For those of you that are watching and don't have smell of vision, we have old Chicago wardrobe and pizza. <laughs> Getting ready for my conversation. It's always Carmela, how's the weather in Virginia? Good? Okay. 75 and sunny. Oh, that's beautiful. That's Thursday for us. We get that later in the week, but it's wet. Two more auto tech, right? So while the board chair gets a bite of pizza, uh, let me let me give you some cool news. This just in actually got it yesterday from Laura. Um, our student loan default rate. Remember, it's one of those things that if it goes over a certain percentage, we get in trouble. But it's always been steadily, slowly dropping. I think last year it was about eleven percent. And fifty, if you get on the high side of fifteen, you get in trouble. Uh, so we're going to take Neil can't Neil can't guess because he knows Carmel I think knows. So so for board members, pick a number between five and ten. Nine. Twelve. Five. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying again. I'm gonna do five and a half. The correct answer. Which none of you got? <laughs> Six point eight. Wow. Now, as Laura pointed out in her email to me, it's the COVID impact. Remember, we paid off a bunch of student debt, which was a wise thing to do because it paid ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and other things with stimulus funds that helped students last year. So I'm not going to say it's an accurate reflection, but it's it's COVID impact, but it's also an impact of the good work Cicely does in financial aid and Laura and, and many of our faculty and staff working with students. But that is like cut almost in half. So that is fantastic. Okay, great. So with that, I will turn it over to you to rock and roll. Let's go. You got everybody's turn? Yeah. Uh, yep. Dave's not here tonight. Dave's not here, and uh, uh, Tim is up at fire jet. Oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> Still. All right. We're ready to go. I'll declare this. Uh, Meeting of the board of directors for Manhattan Area Technical College session. It's an agenda. Motion to 
Okay, so first item tonight under discussion of ends is an update from one of our programs, Automotive Tech. So Jeff and whoever else you might have, it's, it's over to you. Okay, well, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties in a few spots, so I guess it's just me. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I had to sit outside. My wife's doing some other things inside, so... Um, <laughs> I'll just go over a few things real quick for you to bring up to speed on our program and where we're at. Um, had quite a few changes in the recent past over the last couple of years. Um, I'll start with mine. If, if uh, Jaron or Alex make it in, um, then they can do their part. Um, mostly what I want to uh, bring to your attention is some of the um, current situations with our students at the college. Um, we're doing very well. Our second uh, year students are, are hitting the ground running. Uh, a lot of great things coming out of that that part of the, the program. Um, our first year students um, were completely full, actually one more than we can see, still holding strong. Um, so that's very encouraging on what we're doing and where we're headed. Um, we have a, a strong demand in our, our service area for, for new technicians. We've had calls all summer, really desperate for new talent, adding to the workforce. Um, everyone's short on employees as everybody seems to be in the area in all parts of the industry and whatnot. Um, we have currently have, uh, as far as students, since Alex and I have been present at the program, we have five students now at Flint Hills Ford working full time. Uh, we also have students at uh, Firestone, Briggs Motors, Little Apple Toyota, Precision Auto, Eckert's, O'Reilly's, Cap City Nissan, Buyer Construction, um, and some city places of uh, Leonardville as well. So um, we got a lot of students out there. We have about 15 uh, students of ours that are in our, our service area working full time now. So it's really encouraging to know that they're staying local and that money's staying in our communities. Um, a lot of what we're trying to do too going forward is work on uh, relationships with the high school, get more of a, a segue, if you would, to uh, those students coming into our program. That seems to be growing each year. Um, I hope to work a little more closely with some counselors um, there and get a few more of the students that are more interested in our program uh, present there so that they can move on to, to uh, MATC and continue their education there. Um, I think it looks like Alex is with us now. Um, so I think I'll go ahead and let him do his part there on what we got going on, uh, extra stuff with our first year of the program and some of the high school information. Are you with me, Alex? Okay. Alex, there we go. go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> things things aren't working very well for me right now, but that's okay. Okay. So our our new group uh, at MHEC, we have a, a rather large group. We started starting with 17 students. Those couple come from the high school who are entering in the program just a little bit later because of classes they received credit for. Uh, during high school. I'm a little encouraging also. We have two female students this year, which we had in time. So that's been a good dynamic in the classroom. Um, something that's been kind of interesting, I don't know if Jeff touched on it, but the, the uh, semiconductor or computer chip shortage that we've seen in the automotive industry has, has kind of rippled down to us and has really bolstered the demand for our students right now as uh, used cars are are being fixed uh, a lot more than they were in the past uh, due to not even being able to purchase new vehicles. And so we've really seen an uptick in demand and uh, it's been really interesting to talk with our students who are in the field and are uh, experiencing that firsthand and what they bring back to us to talk about. Uh, we did go ahead and order uh, our new simulator. It's a new fuel injection simulator. We've needed to update ours for a long time. And uh, unfortunately with COVID, it's back ordered about a hundred days, but uh, it is ordered and on its way and that'll be a big improvement to our program also. I think that's about all the updates that I had on my new group. Do you have anything else? You're muted, Good. Jeff. <laughs> 
there we go. Sorry, <laughs> my bad. I had a practice on Zoom. Um, so it looks like Jaron's not on here. Make make sure here. Um, so to bring you up to speed, Jaron has moved his position from an assistant to um, uh, partial faculty, and he's doing instruction at the high school for us and still filling in as an assistant here at the college. Uh, that's enabled us to add uh, courses over at MHS. We have five courses there we offer now. So in a total between the college and the high school, we have 90 automotive students. Um, so that's really added a lot to what we're doing um, and gives us a really good pool of students to hopefully choose from to fill our college courses down the road. Um, so hey, Jeff. I'm sorry. Yes, there we are. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, sorry. There you are. I didn't see you at all. Sorry yep. about that. I'll I apologize. I can't get the camera to work. Zoom says that uh, it can't find it and I've tried resetting it and for some reason it's not working. So I apologize. Um, but I am here and my name is Jaren. It's not Abigail. That would be my wife. No idea why her name's on my screen. So this is a heck of an introduction for you guys. But um, yeah. Well, like tell us, tell things, us about so, the high school. Uh, high school's going well. Uh, first semester there, three periods, uh, fourth period, fifth and sixth, um, two intro classes, and then an electrical one class. Uh, uh, things are going well. With the intro students, uh, I'm finding that uh, getting them motivated and just doing the task sheets is uh, the primary focus of that class. Um, but also really working with them and generating the interest in the automotive field um, is paramount in that class. My electrical one class, they've already been through the intro class. Uh, those students know what they're getting into and they, they chose to stick with us. So uh, that's a positive sign that we were able to fill 11 seats in that class. Um, and and that, those students are great because they're there, they want to learn, they're very interactive. Um, with the intro classes, there's some students that's it's quite difficult to get them involved. Maybe um, we can work with the counselors and uh, try and be a little more selective with the students who do want to get involved because both of those classes were very full. We started off the semester 17 and 16, and I think we have a max seating of 16 students for those classes. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're packed and some of those students, you know, you can tell that they just don't want to be there and they were just thrown into the classroom. So I think working with counselors moving forward and really trying to uh, be more selective with the students who actually want to be involved in that class will also help our retention rates moving forward with future classes. Good. Questions? Jaren, did you have any any contact with the counselors before this first go around? Uh, no, I had uh, some contact with the uh, uh, with Katie Ball up there at USD three eighty three. She is one of the counselors, but that was mostly working with her on helping the students get enrolled into the classes. Uh, I was not involved in the during the summer or the previous semesters. So Jaren was a program assistant in the program that was just on site here um, with Jeff and Alex teaching at the high school. This is our third year, Jeff, right? Third? Oh, okay. So this is our third year being at MHS taking over their program. And so the reason why Jaren is now faculty having teaching responsibilities is the fact that we've had to increase the number of periods that learning to teach at the high school because of the number of students interested. So this is Jaren's first year actually being a, a, a faculty member, full-time faculty member. And so he spends his time between teaching the periods at the high school and then being the PA. So um, Jeff and Alex have worked real closely with Lauren and then Katie and then uh, Chris Colburn at the MHS building this program up. But um, Jaren's actually, he's very correct in the fact that now that we've kind of got our presence there, now we really need to nail down, you know, who's taking the automotive program and who's actually <coughs> interested because we only have so many instructors, there's only so many seats with the accreditation that we hold, there can only be so many students within the class um, to meet those requirements. So um, it's a good problem to have. Yeah, I, I mean, I just look at it, you know, we want to be selective mm -hmm. and not waste our instructor's time or their students. If they want to be somewhere else, right? you know, let them go. We just got to make sure we're identifying the right people. Early. So we're brainstorming some things. 
Yeah, Absolutely. it may just that's a change in personnel, and then they're coming out of COVID. Um, it's some things. Part of the issue that he brought up also will be addressed as we keep developing the career mm -hmm. academy and that interlocal agreement. You know, so we'll start getting. And, and Katie does a heck of a job for us up there, but we're going to have to get a, a little more of a role and more advising <clears throat> with them and the students. The selective admission process. Yeah. But it's growing pains. One one other thing I had for Jeff or Alex, I mean, as you guys, that was a great news story about the, you know, the chip shortage is not a good thing, but the fact that our students are in higher demand and are having the opportunity to exercise, use their talents that they've acquired here. I don't know if we can, can get that out, you know, as part of our marketing and branding, like get a news story out, you know, good news that our, our people in our community can do this in response to the chip shortage, I think we a good selling point for us. Do you guys have anything to add? No, I'm I'm good there. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Come on, Jeff. <laughs> I, I think we blundered this enough for one night, so we're we're good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. No, thank and, you, guys. Before you go, Jeff or Alex, uh, tell a little bit to the board about your advisory committee. I, I can do that, I guess. <laughs> um, we have a, um, our advisory committee is really good, uh, very supportive of our program, um, very involved. We, of course, involve them quite heavily in our third party accreditation through ASC um, each time we do that as well. So they're very familiar with our program, our capabilities, and they bring a lot of things to the table uh, for the needs of the industry, um, and they're showing some good support, too, for our needs of equipment moving forward uh, with the Wamigo situation, things of that nature. So uh, here now and down the road, it looks like they're going to be um, very supportive and influential in what we do. So I can't say enough good things about them. Thank you. I'll say almost all of our members probably are past graduates from many years ago and some very recent graduate. So it's always nice to be able to reconnect with them on that level and, and they're able to, to guide us based on the fact they've been through the program. Give them to donate money. <laughs> <laughs> or equipment. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you, Alex. Yep. Yep. Thanks, guys. Think Neil's up next. Yep. So, um, Within your packet should be um, a little sheet that has kind of a four-year trend pattern. Uh, Headcount credit hours up to you and average credit hours. Um, Jim wanted me to kind of give a, you guys a roadmap update, and I said last um, time I was here, where are we in October? September. No, nope. August um, board meeting that we kind of weren't real solidified on the fall preliminary numbers. These are now the the fall preliminary numbers that have been uh, submitted. So you can see our, our head count is 876. Um, we're a little north of 7,000 credit hours. Um, and then FTEs are, are um, full time or full time equivalency. Yes, thank you. And then um, average credit hours um, based upon um, high school and non high school students. This does just account for undergraduate. I unfortunately don't have um, adult education numbers in here, just as an FYI. So if you were to probably put those in there, um, your headcount would probably be around 920 or so. Um, yeah, so. Um, so as you guys can see, obviously, um, we do have a trend kind of moving from the non high school. Um, based enrollment into high school, um, as it's been trending that way for a little while. That's something that obviously Jim and I are aware of and what we're tracking, um, especially since um, the non or the high school students don't pay fees. Um, so obviously we'll look at that, making sure that that trend kind of stays like where it's at or continues to go up. Um, so we haven't really covered pro post COVID yet. Um, but I foresee us probably in the next year or so uh, breaking probably say 500 credit hours next year. Um, we're just unfortunately, um, some of the credit hours were lost within our nursing program as well, a significant portion, which is un unlike that program. Some of it's just COVID related, um, refusal to get vaccines um, and things of that nature that, that kind of has about 300 
credit hours and rental on it. Um, so with those numbers, we do about seven three hundred. It's also our first full year without dental hygiene. Last year we had the teach up, so that's out of the picture. So again, it's, it's trending the right way. We, we haven't covered full pre-COVID, but the numbers overall are good. The headcount enrollment's not quite a 10% increase over last year. The FTE is between 2 and 3% over last year. At some point, KBOR will release 20th day enrollment data on all the institutions. When I get that, I'll send it out to you. Uh, my, my best guess is tech colleges are going to see an increase. I'm not sure the universities have recovered yet. We'll find out. I've heard I've heard everything up and down on the universities. Out. Community colleges, um, some are struggling to get back to pre-COVID numbers. But I think tech colleges, again, workforce, hot topic. Anything else, Mr. Ross? Not so, unless there are questions by the board of that or anything. Okay. Uh, Title three close out and adult education. Chris. Yes, sir. Title three's days are numbered. There are two days left in this grant project. That's really numbered. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this morning we submitted the final rec, and so our balance with the, the feds is zero. So all money has been spent correctly. All objectives have been met. The project was. My opinion of success. Uh, two weeks ago, we started our, our evaluation for the fifth year, and we will, uh, I'll probably have a report for you all for the next board meeting in October. Um, but all good comments. In fact, we evaluated and we'll come back the second day, um, just saying that all the documentation was in line. She was very happy with the conversations that she had had while on campus. Um, so, yes, we are, we're in a good place with that. Um, <clears throat> For adult education, I have a report. I think last four days, I reported we had 48 students enrolled. Uh, had, since our testing center reopened, uh, we've had two students graduate since then, just in the few short weeks. Um, and our enrollment is at 43 right now. So I've only had three students that have dropped. And those have mostly been due to those of our location. Um, we're doing well. We have another orientation in uh, two weeks, uh, and we already have uh, 18 ESL students enrolled. Or, and we have 12 GED students as well. Um, and then right before the board meeting tonight, I met with Aaron Esterbrook and his committee for the Afghan uh, refugees uh, placement and their task force that's here in town. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously a part of that to help with uh, the adults to, for English language services. Um, so I do have a voice on that. Uh, they anticipate, anticipate the first round to start next week or the week after with about 20 individuals. So they're they have a really good plan going forth. And if you guys haven't seen any of that or heard any of that, I definitely recommend reaching out to Aaron Estabrook or just looking into that program because it, there's a lot. I think we had 48 different uh, individuals on that conference call today, and everyone's willing to help and we're going to get housing and get them into our, our community and get them going. So any question on Title Three or Adult Ed? Um, the tie back to previous graduates of our adult education. Yes. Do we have any success stories of people who have, you know, come back, got their GED, gone out, were able to obtain some kind of employment, you know, some benefit from gaining that? Yes, I, I, I personally know quite a few. I'm, I'm really connected with all of our students. Mm -hmm. I can. That's a project that Neil and I have talked about and, and working on that, not only for marketing, but just so we have that data as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have had a couple of students also move into, we have a student right now in the auto tech program. Um, and so yes, there are stories there and I just, I need to gather and find a good system on that. If, if we have, if we have people that are willing to participate sure. in those types of things, again, it just goes back, one, it's marketing and, and we get more people to yeah. recognize the programs here. But again, selling our impact on our local community, I mean, would do wonders for us. And, and I just, every chance we get to do that, I mean, I know you guys are busy doing a whole lot of stuff, but I mean, somebody who we've dealt with people before, we talked to some of those students that came back, for whatever reason they didn't finish high school, you know, we talked to them before graduation, and, you know, they pretty much had given up on education. And to see them come back and go through the program and stick with it, 
And to see that, be able to tell the success story is amazing. Just ask you guys to take a look at that. I don't know how much y'all watch KSMT, but I was almost getting tired of our ads. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of, kind of saturated. Then I didn't know we were co-sponsoring the sports report. <laughs> like, Surprise! I kept getting messages. People, you guys rich or what? <laughs> oh, no, no, it's all freebies. <laughs> we just know us. We got the yeah. stars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I just want another note. I beat up my employer about the marketing that we've been able to do here. And with KSMT, and I reached out to them and they gave us a proposal. And I told them, that just look at the impact that it's having on MATC. I mean, sporting events, during the news, all those other things where a broad range of people are watching. I think we're doing a tremendous job you know, with our advertisement. I mean, like I said, people might get tired of hearing about us or we're going to you know, overwhelm them and they all want to come see the campus. But we'll, we'll get it done one, one way or the other. So keep it up. One thing at a time. I, Madam Vice President. Yes, I do have an announcement about Chris. Um, because the Title III grant is ending in two days, like he said, um, I had to figure out, you know, he's done such an amazing job. He stepped into this, this role as the director of Title III on top of being the director of the Adult Learning Center. And, you know, I'm not going to let him just go back to being the director of the Adult Learning Center, of course. You know, I got to keep him busy. So with the growth of the institution, because of the um, students that he already works with, the relationships he's already built with 383, um, being that's where the Adult Learning Center started. Um, he is actually going to take on the role of being the Dean of Academic Partnerships and Outreach effective October 1st. What that means is, is that we're going to build on his expertise in the necessity side of the Adult Learning Center, and he is going to um, kind of be boots on the ground and doing logistic pieces as we move into building the Career Academy, working with the high schools. Um, because of the growth with the partnerships with the high schools, he will be specifically doing the administrative side of it. Right now we have one individual who was trying to handle both the administrative building programs and that nature and then the student services side that is being split out. And so we'll have a team that will concentrate specifically on the enrollment side and then Chris working with Nathan and I will work on building the partnerships with the high schools themselves and programs and opportunities. And so um, at the same time, because this is where our growth potential is, uh, we'll be working towards the proposal for the next Title III grant as well. And so he'll still have his hands in the grants because he'll still have the author grant and everything and still be the director of the, the Adult Learning Center. So I am very excited. Can you say his title again? <laughs> director or Dean of Academic Partnerships and Outreach. That's a mouthful. <laughs> 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 it's better than the dead one. <laughs> yeah, dean of external academic development. Yeah. Dead. So then, <laughs> then we had Probably dope. Does. He was gonna be the dope dean. Then we thought dean of outreach and active partnerships, but the other way looked down a little more fresh. Yeah. So, <laughs> us and our academic. Congratulations. Thank you so yeah. We're very excited. Thank so. Yeah. Just put on your running shoes. Yes, sir. Good stuff. Truly deserved, man. Great job. Thank you. All right, where are we? A couple things for me. Um, the state regents put together their budget request to give to the governor's budget staff. No big surprises. The bulk of it, of course, is for the universities. Excel and CTE, the stuff we do with the high schools, trying to get more funding for that. Uh, some folks within the regents staff think that should cap at 40 million a year. Uh, it's going to be an interesting thing moving forward. Also, some folks think that it's going to level off because of the Promise Act scholarship. Uh, I haven't seen that yet. There's been more problems with the Promise Act, which have to be addressed. Um, there is support to look for more capital outlay and the tax credit. So, again, no changes on that. But our strategy with the tech colleges is look more to legislature. Cape Moore can propose, the governor can propose, but the actions in the legislature. Um, at the same time, the tech colleges are working on the proposal to the SPARC committee on stimulus funds. Uh, we've also been invited to be part of an EDA grant put together by many institutions, including K-State's Technology Development Institute, with Jeff Tucker, and uh, we'll probably be part of their proposal, which is looking at micro factories scattered around many Kansas communities like Emporia here, Hutchinson, et cetera. And if they're funded, they would actually go in and build 
uh, buildings that could basically become factory incubators and help stand those up. So we'll see. We're glad to be part of that. Um, tomorrow, Sarah and I will meet with General Myers and the K-State Provost. And uh, I'll probably send you guys an update on how that meeting goes sometime tomorrow or Thursday, because I have no idea what they want to talk about. If they want to merge with us, as long as they become MATC East. <laughs> yeah. The chamber uh, and their work with Jack and Pot County, they've had a lot of inquiries for businesses to come into this area. There's one very major one that they're a finalist for. Um, a lot of support from the state of Kansas without giving too much away. Um, State Department of Commerce Tech Manhattan to be the lead community on this project. Uh, we have had more uh, involvement than normal. We're always involved, but this one's even more because of unique things we have a critical environment tech. It is a biotech company. And so we're preparing some final things. Um, if the chamber happens to land, and if that happens to land, because it will be a game changer. Let's see. But it's all good to be involved in those things. Um, the, the next one, so we met with Riley County and city commissioners throughout the summer, Harry and I have, and then we met with Jason Smith from the chamber last week as well. Thursday, we're having a meeting of the Career Academy Executive Committee, um, and really trying to push it. It's time to do something or get off the pot if you want this to happen. The labor data is clear. We can structure the thing in a variety of ways, and we'll get to work on that. We actually have a meeting on that tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, working with 383. We've come down to five centers, uh, IT, events, manufacturing, construction, engineering, tech, healthcare, bioscience, biotechnology. The fourth one is uh, transportation, warehouse and logistics, and then number five is food and agriculture. Uh, you know, some folks say, can you put it all under one roof? I don't see where that's going to happen. The ninth grade center could be used. It's a pig of a building from a utility point of view. Uh, from an access point of view, the school district has to keep it. It's their IT up. Uh, you know, it could be a place to start some things, but it's not an ideal space to make what we want to have happen. In talking with Commissioner Ford, we kind of brainstormed that what we're starting to do, and I met with the Riley County Planner, is to try to look at the county and the city, what property is owned by either the county, the city, or the school district. What, what could we use that's not on tax rolls? Uh, there is space right around the ninth grade center. If you take out the tennis courts, there's some green space there. You could build right there by the ninth grade center. Uh, but I also found out there are some folks trying to work with the county commission. Where could they relocate fairgrounds in the rodeo? Well, Seco Park would be a heck of a place to build a career academy. Uh, and people kind of get excited. So we're going to be talking more about that on Thursday because that would be, to me, if you want to try to put everything almost in one roof. There's room there. Uh, so we'll see. So a lot of cool things happen there. And uh, let's stop there. Any questions? Who are the players on that committee? We have, um, I'm not going to remember all the names. We have uh, Wayne Sloan from BHS, uh, Dr. Paul's representing medical, uh, Jason Hilger's assistant city manager, uh, Bert Hendricks, Greater Manhattan Community Foundation. Dave Urban from our board, Kristen Bright from the school board. Marvin, of course, the superintendent. Uh, I'm trying to think from the other places on business. We have reps from the Manhattan Chamber. One or two other business people. I'm trying to think of uh, it's representing almost all of those sectors. We have two folks from, from K State, uh, Kent Glasscock, Rebecca Robinson. So they've been, they've had good questions. We've spent time this summer working with the school board. Uh, Lyle Butler's on the group as well, former chamber exec. We've looked at different structures, uh, the Lincoln Academy, Nashville Academy, the P-Tech Academy model from New York and Texas. Uh, Lawrence School District has a college and career center combined with Boys and Girls Club. Uh, we've had conversations as well with some of those job courses. COVID is eating their lunch right now because of the federal guidelines. Mm -hmm. If you ever get past that, they could probably ramp back up. So it's been a very Manhattan, and then it's starting to spread out into becoming a regional. 
Uh, we've had discussions about how our Wamego area might become the transportation hub for the academy. I'd be glad to include Junction City folks if we could get them involved. Thank you, Seth. All right. So. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Time for some of the meteor stuff for the meeting. All right. Policy. Sarah. Oh, policy. <laughs> um, so uh, our ADM program, our associate degree nursing program, is preparing to go through their um, ACE and accreditation visit and transport and nursing visit. And so through that process, I'm working with um, the DON, which uh, Kim Davis, uh, she's actually uh, October 1 going to be the Dean of Nursing and Health Programs um, to help us concentrate on, on those areas. But uh, we're updating the policies that are part of the nursing program. And one of the things we discovered was those, while well, those policies were within the nursing program themselves, they weren't part of the institution, which means they weren't outwardly available for students to actually see, you know, um, there may be talk, you know, they may refer to something within their packet, but they weren't uh, publicly accessible. So we're changing that. We're getting in compliance and making them, putting them out there with risk for our policy. So I um, humbly request the board's approval of this new policy, policy 5.1.5, uh, nursing program CNA waiver policy. What this policy is, is that individuals who may have their EMT license um, or been uh, certified medical assistants, um, or have um, come from the military can go through this policy uh, to apply to take the CNA licensure. Um, they won't obtain the CNA license, but they can take the exam and the skills exam to not have to take the course. If they pass, they don't have to take the course, but yet it meets the requirement to apply for our nursing program. So that's what this is, is this a way to break down a barrier that may exist for others who may already have some medical training prior. Um, to allow them to meet a requirement and, and still apply to our nursing program. Questions? That was straightforward. Just give me a double check because it made it can waiver policy now and then. It always does that. I work in a hospital. I work in a hospital and it drives me crazy because it always wants to change it. Same thing with ADA. Same thing with ADA. It changes the A under yeah. me. Yeah. 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 Like, I know what I'm doing. No, I, I like it. I think action on that, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, we need action to have a motion to approve the policy on the CNA waiver program policy. So moved. Properly moved. Do I have a second? A second. Properly moved and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. All right, so kind of a quick thing on the tech side, and then we'll do a couple of facility updates. Um, you are all probably familiar with or have used it before uh, with multi-factor or two-factor authentication, like you get the text message to log into a system. So we've um, had that set up for opt-in for quite some time for all of our employees and students with kind of some campaigns to try to get them to do that. Um, We've, we've got a large percentage going that way. Uh, we'd always plan to uh, move toward enforcement as time progresses. Um, our cybersecurity insurance policy came up for renewal and a new requirement that they had before they would uh, write that renewal is to actually have multi-factor authentication enforced across the entire college. So that kind of forced the issue. Um, so we've been working on getting it, the enforcement for all the employees first. It does change your day-to-day -day a little bit. You know, it's a little bit of a change and interruption. So we did get them to agree to allow us to push the students to enforcement um, at the rollover of the semester. So they're going to write the policy and then uh, in the changeover semester in December, January. Then if you're a student, then when you come back, you will then have to use multi-factor. Any questions on that? On the facilities kind of safety side, I know we talked about the um, AEDs and getting some more of those going. Um, we did go ahead and move forward with, with getting some of those purchased. Uh, we have a good contract with Zoll 
Um, they are the, the fully automated voice controlled ones. So instead of just going from the one we had in the commons, um, there also used to be one in the dental clinic, but we're gonna go to a total of four uh, spread out across campus, um, HVAC, 307, commons, and then down out in the RTC to try to get a, a one in each location, which is only half the battle. The other part to that is um, signage, uh, probably work with, with Neil some on pointing those out in the program areas in day two or during orientations or just kind of figure out how we actually show these students where they're at um, and then employees as well. Um, so we'll work on some signage for those. Um, we're still working on the train project with our overall uh, look at our HVAC system um, campus-wide. It's been a slow process. They take a lot of data to kind of look at uh, past analytics of usage bills and things like that. So. Um, that's still happening. It's just taking longer, but hopefully the next step will be coming pretty soon for an on-site walkthrough to actually get eyes on our systems and try to build us out a plan. Jim will probably talk a little bit more about Wamigo, but we are, um, the construction is mobilizing for the phase three of building two. I'm gonna share a quick drawing just to remind everybody what exactly that entails. It's clean. Yeah, very good. It's a little delayed. Um, so it's a dial-up motor. Get this to go out. That's a little better. There, that's better. Okay, so we're looking at building two. For those of you who have been over there, the gray area on the left is what already has been completed. And then phase three is what you see in the white. So that it involves a lab slash classroom, a smaller auto tech classroom, and then another kind of general use classroom. And the lab classroom is for both biology and chemistry. Yeah, all, all sciences, bio, AP, it's all in preparation for the end of them. Yeah, so they actually started uh, doing some concrete work there today. So they're, they're moving on it. We'll probably see some changes going pretty fast. In addition, we've signed a civil engineering contract to help prep towards building three. Because we're going to need some. We'll be requesting significant assistance from the city of Wamego to run utilities over there, help with the parking lot, etc. Building three is where we'll put the cat welding lab and probably two thirds of the building and one third of the building for an electrician lab. Sarah and I met with reps from NC3 and Greenlee, a lab which does electrical electrician training. Uh, the cost for their equipment and first year consumables is pretty reasonable, 120,000, 100,000 that's for the equipment. Uh, in addition, when we put that in place and get through the train the trainer process, that will give us 10 more industry credentials for really for electricians. So we're going to be working with uh, BBN and ICON, the contractor, to put start them together the timetable on building three and it works with Carmela and uh, Melissa on funding. Um, in addition, uh, Sarah and I have had contact and Nathan with uh, our counterparts from North Central Tech and Beloit uh, to bring their CDL program into our territory. So they've shared some list of things they need. I've, I've given that to Jack Alston to help work on this because we need space where we can do the truck backing, turning, docking. Uh, but we're trying to see if we can ramp that up so that we can bring that in faster while we're working on funding for another building where we can bring in CDL and diesel at the industrial park in Montego. So that's where things stand. I'm gonna turn it to Sarah in a minute to talk about business after hours. Uh, before I forget, Something back to uh, Chris and, and the Afghan situation. A lot of stuff going on, of course, here in Pike County. I'm sure there's an injunction. I'm not as in the loop on everything over there. Um, but like today, I got asked to be on four other committees here in Manhattan, on the Housing Authority Committee. And then they want input from, M from MATC on their the Indoor Aquatic Task Force. 
I'm not sure where we're putting that yet. Got <laughs> that contract over here. Shelf. <laughs> but and I also I also know in relation to a lot of things that are going on. As LJ asked me, we had we had lunch yesterday. There are a lot of folks in town in the business world and in city government looking at how the heck they help us ramp up because they think things may explode in the right way. And they know we're a key to them as a world provide. So we're definitely getting brighter blip on the radar of a lot of places. Well, Amigo is one of those. Let's talk about all the PR you're doing. Love Amigo. Amazing. Who lives there? I know. Um, October 7th is uh, Grow Green. So the Longigo Community Foundation will be hosting Grow Green on October 7th at Ironclad. Um, from seven, they're open seven to seven and then they take donations at midnight. Um, they had reached out to the chamber and asked about doing an after hours along with uh, Grow Green. Um, and interesting enough, we had already committed to doing after hours in October. So. Uh, we are actually co-hosting Business After Hours with Go Green, which is fantastic. People are already out giving money. So um, from 5 to 7 on October 7th, uh, we will be co-hosting Business After Hours between the MATC Wamego Center and uh, Ironclad. So individuals can go between, you know, come over to the center, see what we're doing, and then we're hoping to figure out a trolley or some type of transportation that they can Go over then to Ironclad and make donations. We'll have a live feed between the locations. So whether you are at the center or at Ironclad, you can see what's going on um, with the donor board. You can see what's going on at the center. We will have food and drinks, alcohol <coughs> at both locations. So please come and be merry. Um, we are going to, uh, one of our main raffles is going to be a playhouse that was built by our own very own construction technology center. Um, and then Jim's working on my second uh, donation <coughs> raffle gift. Uh, the Wamigo Foundation will actually do, um, they'll draw a, a business that's part participating and they'll give additional donations as well. So basically every half hour, one of us will be doing a raffle. Um, but it should be a lot of fun. Um, we're working on getting that uh, Place cleaned up um, the campus projects and Josh's team's help, and uh, everybody's excited. Everybody's so excited that we're doing this. The community is buzzing about us being there. People are ready to see what's going on. But um, we're hoping that being that the first building done is done and in the first phase of the second building is done, that we'll have the renderings up of what we're going to do for the second phase, along with um, what we're going to do for the third building, and that hopefully will drive individuals to want to donate and help us participate, you know, participate in what we're trying to do and build there. And, and um, it should be, it should be great. I hope you guys can come. LJ, please. Oh, I'll be out of town visiting my daughter in New York. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, I will make my donation. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we get your money, that's what's not. <laughs> well, you know, we've, we've done, we've done a tremendous job as a board uh, since I've been a member with our, our members, 100%. We think that's a very big selling point when we go out. And ask other people for money. Mm -hmm. We can tell people that all of our board members contribute to so we'll keep that train going. Um, and then I know we had started uh, working with faculty, you know, doing payroll reductions and things like that. Um, hopefully, that's still going yeah. well. Um, you know, we we are our biggest supporters. You know, and, and the fact that we get behind what we do and we believe in it says a lot to the other people in the community. Um, so we want to be able to brag about that and continue to build. The money for, for our nest day. The community foundation will match up to five thousand dollars, which is up two thousand for three thousand from last year. So, um, which is which is a huge help too. They're they're you know doing their part as well. So, we hope you guys can all come out. Do we have a specific goal set yet? Uh, no, eight hundred thousand dollars. That's what I need for the third building. As much as we can get. Yeah. Not yet. Well, we're not sure yet, roughly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on the third building, we also oh, had had them look into was it be cheaper to put a new building in? Uh, okay. Sometimes it is. Uh, when they ran the estimates, it was actually a half million more. There's some issues there. So, you know, anything we get, 
the, the key thing is whatever we do, it builds more, keep building more. Uh, the other thing going on there, of course, the school district over there said complete administrative turnover. It's been rough. Uh, they, they've been doing their best. Sarah has been plugged into that. We have Suzanne Duncan full time mm -hmm. as coordinator at the Wamigo site now. Uh, there are some parents, uh, and Sarah and I and Brian have met with a uh, representative of a parents group that's kind of itchy to help move kids into early college move toward us. We're working with that, but working with the school administrators. It's got to have the school district support as well. But I would say, you know, getting through COVID and then there will turn over of administrators, things you don't expect to have happen. Um, Brian, and I know he's, yeah, he's still on. Brian's done a heck of a job adapting and providing math instruction over there. But the interest is just keeps gaining more and more. We're scheduling a late semester CNA class over there, more courses in the spring. I think we'll have a full array of things for fall next year. And a lot of times people get impatient, and I understand it. We can only go as fast as some of our resources allow. But also, we've got to make sure that when we do enroll in these classes, we'll break even. We can't afford to lose money on them either. So, again, it's been a lot of good conversations, a lot of good cooperation and collaboration. So, I think over the next several months, we'll see a huge change with what's going on. All right, now it's time to get into the nitty gritty of some monitoring reports. And I would call on the other Madam Vice President, Carmela Jacobs, from the great state, great Commonwealth, excuse me, Commonwealth <laughs> of Virginia. It's not a state there, Commonwealth. Thank you, Jim, for that great introduction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, here is one of the annual uh, monitoring reports that uh, Jim, along with uh, the accounting office, puts together for you. And so what this is, is our financial condition as of uh, June 30th, 2021. I'd like to remind you that they are interim statements as we undergo our audit in two weeks, and then those will be the final statements. And typically there are some adjustments that are made, and that's why we call them the interim statements, because they will change due to any adjustments um, from the auditors. Um, but as policy provision one, uh, making sure that we do not exceed the budget for July 1 through June 30, um, we report compliance and uh, fail to maintain an appropriate cash reserve. At this point, uh, the cash is at $806,000 well, as of 630 which doubled uh, from previous years because it, it was low in previous years. So at that point, we could have maintained operations for about seven months without any additional income. Uh, Jim and I work very closely together to um, put strategies together to see what we can do to increase that. And so again, you know, we know that we want to increase that to at least, at least, uh, one full year without uh, additional income to be able to uh, operate the college, um, even with its growth. So attachment 10 is going to be the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net assets. Um, and so what you'll see here in the operating revenues, as we've talked about before, is we um, had a 280% increase in our federal grants, which that, were, that um, was due to the stimulus funds and um, the CARES funds, um, and then we had 135% in state and local grant contracts. Um, and so with that, that will absolutely increase your expenses because it is a re they were reimbursement grants, so we had to spend to get reimbursed. And so that, of course, is why our supplies and other operating expense and contractual services were both on over 100%. Um, and so those together kind of uh, equal each other out. And so um, overall, the financial condition of the college as of 630 is uh, at a satisfactory level. Um, at this time, I can turn it over to you all if you have any questions regarding the financial condition as of 630. Or Jim, if you have anything to add. You know, again, Carmela and her crew have done a heck of a job. 
these well, we're sitting good with money. It's also money with some restrictions. You know, we're trying to communicate that to the employees, trying to use it wisely. And we we're always discussing you know, what we can do, can't do. One of the interesting things on some of the federal funds, is like when they did the third round, they extended the deadline to spend previous rounds. They extended some of the parameters. Those things have all helped. Um, right now, I know Neil and Laura are working on, we have to give out around $700,000 to our students from group three. Uh, and we can't draw down any more of institutional funds we're supposed to get for that until we give the students funding. So, uh, and again, some changes on that, that Neil and Laura are working with our system so the students can apply. Uh, we'll take a look and see what we can do to, to help the students out to an optimal effort. But again, two years ago, we would have never predicted these things and how do we juggle it? If you had told us we were gonna have a pandemic, we probably would have been talking about, oh crap, we're gonna shut the doors because of Title III, because of faculty and staff attitudes and embracing technology and adapting and improvising because of stimulus funds. And then the opportunities for the local economy, because overall it stayed pretty strong. We've come out of this pretty good shape. Jim, uh, I noticed on your report that uh, you uh, participated in a webinar with Federal Economic Development Administration uh, an American recovery plan targeting facilities, equipment, and workforce. Has anything got to come out of that? That's where we're working with Jeff Tucker's group at K-State on their EDI, EDA proposal. Uh, first round of those is due soon, and if you make it to the first round, you get planning money, so then you go for the next phase. Um, so as I worked with Jeff on that, we're trying to take a look at what could we commit. You have to have a 20% match. Uh, our, my focus on that has been looking ahead of one fiscal year in case they get, if they do get funded, but we could use that, our 20%, say we target some of our capital outlay, or if we get more MOE funds or capital tax credit, we could then increase it by four times towards capital outlay, but we'd probably be looking at some equipment we need for Wambigo and, and finishing renovations there, but then also with the Career Academy. Uh, the Festo lab we put in, there is a component that's being built for high schools. So one of the ways we could help push more engineering tech and the things in that mechatronics universe would be to give you some of that funding and put a lab like that, maybe at Wamego, maybe at Manhattan. So those are the kind of things we're looking at working with Jeff. On the SPARC proposal to the state SPARC committee, um, I intend to be asking for up to 20 million and facilities and equipment for us. Are we going to get it? I don't know. But again, Senator Masterson said shoot for the moon. That, I can tell you, Sherry Utah and I are going to shoot for the moon. Good. We do need board action to accept those reports. If you don't have any other questions or comments. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the Internal monitoring report financial condition statements. So moved. Improperly moved. I have a second. Second. Improperly moved and seconded. Any further discussion? No discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Second. Final action item relates to uh, the sim lab that we're expanding another sim lab. Who's going to walk them through this one? That would be Sarah. And Josh. Okay. <laughs> Josh I, I know it's not me. Um, well, we work together to put it together. So yes. uh, I'll let Sarah handle that. Um, so uh, part of getting the COVID funds, and Carmel's going to correct me if I mess on any of this up. <laughs> um, part of getting the COVID funds was looking at our situation institution of um, trying to, you know, social distance and things of that nature, um, where were opportunities to provide more simulation, um, depending on what would happen with the pandemic. And so one of the things we identified was um, putting in an additional SIMMAN lab. So right now we have a SIMMAN lab. Um, it's, uh, it's unique to our program in that it allows the instructor to create real life situations that they may run into with patients without putting a live patient in danger. And 
being able to test and run the students through what would the reactions be um, in that situation. And so um, because we have 88 students in our program, trying to rotate those students through one Sidman lab is, is very difficult in 16 weeks. And so with the opportunity of the COVID funding, um, we are asking for your approval to purchase the equipment and build a second Sidman lab. And um, the unique thing about it is that not only will it benefit our nursing program, but it will also benefit our emergency um, medical technology program as well as our CNAs. And so there have already been conversations with um, our coordinator from the ENT program and our uh, dean of nursing, and they're going to be able to utilize the space to the fullest capacity as well in their training opportunities because when they teach, it's different. It's a different time than what the nursing uh, faculty teach, and so. Um, being that we have the co-ed funds, being that we can allow the students to have even more simulation type opportunities, um, working through some unique situations that they may not necessarily see while they're on clinical, at the clinical rotations, is why we come to you with this proposal. Yeah, and the cost you're seeing there is for the actual equipment only, and then the build of the, I guess, three walls, mm -hmm. a couple doors, and a one-way glass would be donated by uh, icon. And where, room needed for it. and where are you going to put this at? In the nursing lab. Okay. So we've identified a space um, because we've been able to be more efficient about the utilization of the spaces. Um, for example, CNA is now out here and has its own space. Um, so it's not within the nursing lab, but not all trying to share with the CNA students. It's open up a, a space over there that we can build this. And so it'll be right there within the nursing program so they can all use it. The uh, DON is already allowing the EMT program to utilize that space. Like I said, they teach during the day, EMT has their right now their classes at night. And so, um, fullest capacity as possible is what we can with full utilization. Sir, with the second room, will that require additional instructor? No, it won't. It'll just allow them to um, create the environment of more of a patient room rather than working with just a stilled dummy and going through the motions. Right. I would Thanks. only, oh, Go ahead, come on. Go ahead. I was just going to kind of add to what Josh and Sarah both said. So the funding that would be used is that capital outlay maintenance of effort funding that is only for equipment. That is what the restrictions are. And so this was a perfect um, proposal for, to kind of fall in under the, that funding. And then the second part of the um, proposal is the also the waiving of the, um, well, letting you know that we meet the sole source policy where we wouldn't have to go out for an RFP or a bid because it's $101,000 because Lardell was a sole source vendor. So I just kind of wanted to add that to um, what we were saying here. So I was gonna say that um, working in a hospital environment right now, and having students, we have our students over at Good Community Hospital. We're not only limiting the number of students that are coming in, we're limiting the amount of access those students have to real world situations. Um, so students that are on site now are not getting exposed to as much as they would have in the past pre-pandemic. So this is a great opportunity to uh, get them the additional training that, that they may be lacking uh, in a real world setting. So. Um, is there any life expectancy issues with the type of equipment that we're getting? How long do you think it'll last? Or no, I don't remember how long ago we got the original one, but they're still utilizing it. Yeah. Um, so Tony, the EMT instructor, he he was talking about a little bit. There's some maintenance to it, but he said that the you know smaller maintenance costs, but the actual unit itself, the computer part, the board mm -hmm. should be. I mean, I can't imagine. It's better than it used to be. Yeah, I mean, and, and they have different levels of the type of equipment that you can get, you know, oh, kind yeah. of base level when they go yeah. moving up. So as you look at that, you're going to get something that's going to last and you don't have to upgrade in a year or oh, whatever. Yes. So Tony was asking for the $100,000 mannequin that they used it before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm no. like, <laughs> you can see if you donate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, those are all the questions I have. Wait, what's the timeline on this? I mean, is this something we can, based on us approving it, is this something that can get started right away? So the 
you know, the, the bill of the room itself is just like a two to three day build. Um, they're ready to start as soon as this week for that portion. And then it just be, my fear is just like with everything else, it's shit. Yes. Yeah. So that's, you know, that. yeah. that's, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 Are sitting in the queue waiting for the approval. They are like I know they're already sitting there. And he's like they're already there. Does this grow the program for the quantity of students or just the betterment of the program? The betterment of the program, betterment of the instruction. No, we are we are at capacity. We take forty APNs as it is, and then we have um, forty four uh, ADNs. So when they get through like something like this, like are they saying they should be more marketable to? It should help you the county. place that pass rate high. Yes. And that's really what's important. Our, our, our pass rate on UPLEX is tremendous compared to other institutions. And so our yeah. folks are graduating, ready to get licensed and go to work right away. Uh, just compared to some there, there are at least you know. three community colleges. One has lost their nursing program. Two are in danger. We're looking, like she said, at Wamego, where we can expand the PN cohort. Uh, part of one of the other issues is clinical act. It's not just clinical access; it's access to clinical sites that have the right lens. The things our students can do. Uh, I'm just curious, like yeah. after a year, you look at up in the tuition for this program due to its maybe performance. Um, part of it also depends if the feds. You know, there's a lot of talk with some of the budget bills of extending the max on Pell Grants, which gives us some room. Uh, some of our programs were, at, were close to the limit of what we could charge. For, uh, but then the Promise Act also becomes a factor. One of the things that I had this discussion with Kim Davis the other day, I've had it with every nursing director that I've overseen in the last 20 some years. While I love numbers, what matters to nursing is quality. Mm -hmm. If our pass rate's low, that's the worst advertising you can get. Uh, so our, you know, our, our number one emphasis is on that quality, that pass rate. What can we do to help that? The enrollment is going to ebb and flow. Uh, we've had we've lost students, as Neil mentioned, this year. Some of it was due to the students who wanted to be in nursing, but they didn't want to get vaccinated. The clinical sites are almost all requiring you to be vaccinated. You, yeah, you can take our program, but you can't compete because you can't pass the clinical sites. We have no control on that. I, I hear you, but we're always not going to get free money to pay for things like this. Well, I know. Mm -hmm. Road, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. So it's yeah, we're treating it like venture capital. What can exactly. we do to extend the quality? Or in the case if we get able to add more amigo, we might be able to parlay it where those students will be able to come over here to get more instruction. That's growing their coverage. I'm hoping to be able to bring some uh, pass rates and where we stand within the state and get some of the closings and stuff to you uh, next meeting. It's very interesting. Jim mentioned, you know, the sales piece of it. The numbers sell us, mm -hmm. but the performance.